We are pleased to welcome Dr. Elliot Sobel to the University of Charleston School of Pharmacy Class of 2015 White Coat Ceremony. My acquaintance with Dr. Sobel began a little over 20 years ago when I attended a uh, Glaxo Career Pathway Trainers Program. We were both extremely young at the time. And at that time, Dr. Sobel was the Director of Strategic Operations for the Regional Medical Scientist Group in the U.S. Medical Affairs Division of GlaxoSmithKline. Since that time, he has served as the Interim Chair and Program Director for the Department of Clinical Research at Campbell University School of Pharmacy, and now serves as Group Manager, Professional Services for the Target Corporation. In his capacity, his responsibilities include oversight and direction of clinical pharmacy services, pharmacist and technician clinical educational training, integration of clinical assessment for student pharmacist IPPEs and APPEs, and various professional development programs. Dr. Sobel also serves on the specialty governing board for the Foundation for Managed Care Pharmacy. He holds appointments as an adjunct professor at the University of Florida, the University of Minnesota, the University of North Carolina, and Campbell University Schools of Pharmacy. I think we could probably add one more to that. He also was one of the developers and obviously continues to research and train for the APHA Career Pathway Evaluation Program for pharmacy professionals. From 2003 to 2010, Dr. Sobel served as the science officer for the American Pharmacists Association. He has also served on the Board of Visitors for the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy, the Dean's Advisory Board for the Chicago College of Pharmacy, Midwestern University, and is a past board member of the National Council for Patient Education and Information. He also served as Chairman of the Board of Directors of the North Carolina Museum of Life and Science and as a statewide chairman of the North Carolina Math and Science Education Network. A very busy man. He has contributed so much to our profession, and in such, he was selected as a 2003 Fellow of the American Pharmacists Association. He was also honored with the Linwood F. Tice Friend of APHA Academy of Student Pharmacists, the highest honor bestowed by the APHA student members. Other honors have included the University of Wisconsin Graduate Excellence in Teaching Award and the Renenbaum Teaching Award for Excellence at the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy. Dr. Sobel is a self-proclaimed cheesehead and badger, having earned his Bachelor of Science degree, his Master of Science degree, his Doctor of Philosophy degrees in pharmacy, all from the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sobel. Thank you, Dr. Mueller. Um, <clears throat> let's see, it was over 20 years ago, so we were infants when we first did that. So. Well, I, I would like the opportunity to, to welcome everyone here as well. Uh, welcome to student pharmacists who will be colleagues in a short four years, if you think about that or not. Parents and guests, other students who are here, faculty, staff, and the president, uh, president here. Uh, there's so many different opportunities to talk about pharmacy. And what I thought I'd like to do is, is really talk a little bit about the importance of what pharmacy is. And a lot of times you come to these presentations and someone will talk for 30, 40 minutes and we're not gonna do that. In fact, I'm gonna actually challenge the students for a minute right now in kind of a unique way and ask you to give you some call outs. What do you think about pharmacy? What, what are the good things that you're thinking about? Anybody? Helping people. Helping people. Yeah, it's interesting. Helping people is the number one reason that students go into pharmacy. We've been doing uh, career planning for over 20 years, and that is still stated as the number one response that we get. So thank you. It's a great, great profession. I'm one person who's standing here to tell you that <clears throat> back in the 70s when I was in pharmacy school, so all the parents are thinking, oh, that, that sounds pretty cool, and all the students are kind of going, 70s, that means how old is this guy? <laughs> okay. So back in the 70s when I was in pharmacy school, 
I have no thoughts or ideas that at some point in time I may be the science officer of the American Pharmacists Association. No thought of that at all. That I'd be working in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, that I've been fortunate enough to be working in academics. I work as a practitioner in a, in a chain pharmacy now at Target. Uh, a lot of different opportunities. And one of the things that I hope you take away from just today Back in the 70s, I worked with a colleague by the name of Don Rucker, who was my mentor. And back then, Don listed 437 career tracks for pharmacy students. That was in 1970. I can tell you today, it's much more than that. The career opportunities you have facing you are grand. Wonderful opportunities to help others, either directly or indirectly. The other thing I want you to, to think about a little bit is, is what you do now. What you do today in the profession while you're in school is actually gonna, in a sense, direct you where you're gonna go for the future. A lot of people don't necessarily feel that's true, but we've looked at a number of different issues and it kind of holds that past behavior kind of shows you what future behavior is gonna be. So with that, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a challenge, a few challenges throughout this, but one of the challenges that I really have for you is to become active active in the profession of pharmacy. Be active in the associations that we all have as students. Be active in the community, help others. Even as first year students, you have the opportunity to go out and help. I thought the president said it was a, a great way of saying this. When you're out there, you're representing the university. You're also representing the College of Pharmacy. You're also representing pharmacy. And it may sound like, well, it's a huge responsibility. And at times I will say it is, but you're here for a reason. You made it through a certain point to get into this profession. So continue that drive to really be there and where you want to go. So there's gonna be these opportunities that will come up. And the opportunity is gonna be professional based, be that through a student organization or through something the school runs. They're gonna be personal but there are also gonna be opportunities in the community. And again, I really encourage you to take a look at those opportunities. Be active, be involved. Well, as was mentioned is that a colleague of mine, uh, Bill Kelly and I, recently published a book that you have called The Good Pharmacist. And one of the reasons that Bill and I went into looking to, to this is that we felt there was a need for some information to be brought out about what pharmacists do in focusing on patients. So I thought I'd take a, a one minute just to give you some, some very quick understanding about the technical aspects of what we did. So we had a cross-sectional, multi-stakeholder, prescriptive survey. Okay, so we're done with the technical stuff. That's gone. That's the exam part of it. So what we did is we went out and talked to different groups. We talked to patients, we talked to nurses, we talked to physicians and pharmacists. And we asked them to begin to tell us what characteristics make a good pharmacist. So a pharmacist can be good if they have a lot of information and they know everything, but they may not be good if they can't communicate that in an appropriate way. So there's a lot of different ways to look through these. So we actually came up with five different tenets or characteristics that kind of make up a good pharmacist based on these groups that we talked to. And the groups are a little bit different in what they're looking for. But when you take a look at all of this, this is what we uh, developed. One is that a good pharmacist needs to be an expert. An expert is someone who has a great deal of knowledge and skill, but an expert is also someone who understands that they don't know the answer, they say they don't know the answer. That they go and find out the answer and get it to the guest, get it to that patient, get it to the person that they're working with. Very important information to do. Wanted to give you some examples of, of how this, this can play out. So when I was working in the pharmacy uh, about four years ago, I had one of my patients call me. Now I work in a pharmacy in North Carolina. Um, I'm one of these strange people, so I, I work in a pharmacy in North Carolina, but I actually work in Minnesota. So you can figure the long commute to have. On Mondays and Fridays, it gets a little long, but. 
with that said, we opened at nine o'clock in the morning. At nine o'clock in the morning, my phone rang. And I've got one of my patients who lives in North Carolina, who's in Seattle, Washington. And he's having a hard time. Uh, he's actually having a hard time breathing. And he's developed some kind of a rash. And he's called me. And I'm trying to figure out, okay. Very quickly pulling up his profile, looking at all the medications he's on, and he's on a number of them, asking him the questions that you will find out as you move forward, what you want to ask, to find out where we can narrow this down as fast as we can. And in general, first things to think about is how do we slow this reaction down, Benadryl medications, other things that are readily available right up there. We talked for a few minutes. I told him I would get back to him, asked him to do something, used, in a sense, the expertise that we have, made a phone call to the physician's office because I felt we needed to get them involved. Unfortunately, the physician's office response was, well, you know, the doctor's not here right now, and you know, we can try to find him, but it's probably going to be a couple hours. Well, if any of you know what an allergic reaction is, a couple hours is too long. I called this person back, said, go to the ER. They did, and they actually had an allergic reaction to the medication they'd been taking for a couple years that finally came out. So having an expertise to just think through the triage and what to do is very important. But also having the capability of knowing that they called to our pharmacy because they knew that we would follow through with that. The second area that we found is being a professional. And all of you now, when you walk by today and you get your white coat, I hope you have a sense that you're going from a student pharmacist to a student pharmacist who is absolutely a part of our profession. And we're eager to have you join us. Professionalism is really understanding a variety of areas. And as you continue in the pharmacy, I hope that you really get a chance to do that. Getting the idea along with this is a solid work ethic. And this is the one that's a little bit harder. Because I would probably ask all of you, when do you do your best studying? And most of you are going to say the night before the exam. But a solid work ethic means that you really believe intrinsically that continuing your education and continuing to learn and not just memorize for tests is important. And the issue we really have with that today has to do with the fact that when some of us were in the school in the 70s, we had a number of products we worked with. Well, you still have to learn all those things that we had and all the new products and advances that have happened since then. So there's a lot of information. That's not the scary, it's just to say, you're up to the challenge. You made it, go ahead and proceed and move forward with it. Another one that we really find to be of interest is having strong moral character. Not talking about morality, but talking about integrity, talking about honesty. And patients really do understand this. They really want to have pharmacists who have high integrity, that they're looking out for the patient. And in fact, that's what the last tenant is, is to practice what we call visible patient-centered practice. We use the word visible because what's important is that others see what you're doing. Many times in pharmacy, you have a pharmacist who may work with a patient one-on-one -on -one and no one else knows what's going on. But we want it to be visible. We want people to understand. And this does not mean patient-centered just with prescriptions. This can mean someone who comes in to ask you information about an over-the-counter medication. To really drive that home and to help them from that standpoint. So the way we kind of look at that is a very holistic approach from items that, that we look at. My number one challenge to you is to start thinking about how you can do that yourself. Good or bad, I will tell you, you can go right now to any community-based practice or institutional-based practice and probably tell me who the good pharmacist is. But you can probably give me a list of people who are not. So the challenge is that all of you, when you leave here, are good pharmacists. And really take a look at the patient being the center of what you do. There'll be a tremendous amount of information that the faculty will bring to you.
And I will tell you at times, you will think the faculty are crazy. Being an adjunct faculty member at some of the schools, you'll think, how do they think we can learn all this information? And then you're also gonna think to yourself, why am I learning this? And so although <clears throat> we go 40 years ago to being in school, my thought process was the same. And I thought, why am I learning about molar and normal solutions? When am I ever gonna do this? And of course I did an internship at a very small clinic that had a respiratory therapy associated with it. And the pharmacy was in charge of standardizing all the equipment. And guess what we had to do? We had to make normal solutions. I thought, no way I would ever use this. So there may be at times you get frustrated in trying to figure out where it fits in, but believe it or not, it fits in. Because at some point in time, it's really the opportunity to have that knowledge there that you may not remember, but you can go back and find it and work with it. At the same time that we talk about the issues that, that you have, there's also challenges and kind of a charge to the faculty. And while this is here for the white coat ceremony, I really think the opportunity exists also for faculty to understand that they're gonna challenge you in many ways, but at the same time, they're gonna be very supportive. They're gonna try to give you every opportunity you can to learn. They're there for you to ask them questions. And please don't be afraid to ask questions. As someone who has the opportunity to go and talk to different schools of pharmacy, I will tell you, from my personal perspective, if I come in and talk to a class and people don't ask questions, I have no idea if they paid attention, if they liked it, if they didn't like it, or anything. But if they ask questions, I know they're engaged. I know that they're interested. So ask questions. At times you may challenge people, that's fine too. See how things go that way. And from the, again, from the faculty side, the hope is that the faculty will provide you with an environment where you can practice and get the opportunity to role play with others before you're working one-on-one -on -one with our patients. This visible patient-centered care. It's an interesting opportunity that you'll have You'll go out and shadow different pharmacists. You'll go out in rotations. You'll do many different things. But it's the opportunities that you take yourselves that will make the difference. So as I said before, we talk to physicians, pharmacists, nurses, and patients about what it takes to be a good pharmacist. Each of you have all these skills and characteristics that are there. The question is, will you bring them out? Will you provide the opportunity for yourself to really do that? And the last part of all this is taking the role of leadership. So I'll be one to tell you, as I mentioned before, to become very active in the school, become active in the community. So it was kind enough to say that, that I served as a science officer for the American Pharmacists Association. Again, I never really thought of that, but I will tell you, as a student, I was very active. And while you have roughly 80 students in their class. <clears throat> Back in the, the old days when we had 250 students in the class that I was in, I was fortunate enough to serve as a co-class president. And that opportunity gave me a chance to see how to apply some leadership skills and some of the things that the faculty did to help support those activities. So I really encourage you to become active. I encourage you to take this opportunity to really learn what you can but most importantly, I look forward to four years from now, instead of you sitting there, that you're colleagues with us, that you're working side by side with us, and that you're helping patients make informed decisions so they're doing the appropriate therapy that they need. And lastly, I will tell you that you know that you've made it as a pharmacist. See all these people on the side and the back who are here? You know, it's when your parents, or when your cousins, or your sibling, or your aunt and uncle, call you up and ask you a question. Because they want to know your advice on it. You made it. Because they think of you then as the expert. And 
right now you may not feel you have any expertise to add, but I will tell you, in a couple years, perhaps even six months, depending on where you're looking at things, you'll have the expertise. And if you have your own family members who can rely on you, that means you're going to be patient-centered. That means you're going to be someone who's going to be focused on helping others. So I hope you take the challenge. I wish you the best of luck. And I really do look forward to having you as a colleague. Thank you.